So we've got people logged on. Yes, hello everyone. We're just going to give it a minute or so while everyone is coming in. We're up to nearly 50 people at the moment. Let me see, we're getting everyone's, everyone's coming in slowly but surely, brilliant. Thanks guys. Now we have, um, Elaine has raised her hand. Elaine, if you want to send a, a message into chat, you can do that. You can direct it towards the panelists so I can answer you. And John saying hello, Aoife. Hi. <laughs> oh, we've a couple of raised hands, okay. Thanks everyone for joining us. Just keep oh, listen, continuing I'm to so log sorry. in. I want to see me if it's public and I have to go. <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. Okay. No problem. We're just live oh, at the Thanks, Nikki. Bye. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we had a raised hand, but um, a couple of our uh, attendees are actually just waving hello, Aoife. So there you go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So we have 52 attendees at the moment. Perfect. Um, um, and we are on two minutes past three, or three minutes past three. So what we'll do is um, I'll just say a quick hello and do the introductions. And then I'll hand it over to Aoife. Uh, we still have a couple of people joining us slowly but surely. Um, so that's all okay. But just to start, um, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, this webinar is part of the Get Ireland Making Programme by Design and Crafts Council and supported by Creative Ireland. We are delighted to be joined by Aoife Kieran today, who is going to introduce millinery equipment and tools. Just a little bit of housekeeping to start. The session is being recorded. We hope to have this up on Design and Crafts Council YouTube channel um, over the next week or so. So if you know anyone who missed the webinar today and would like to catch up on it, you can direct them to that. And um, the second is that Aoife is more than happy to answer any questions that you have. And I'm sure there will be lots of questions as she's going uh, throughout the webinar. But if possible, we're going to keep them for towards the end. Um, Aoife will be talking us through some of the equipment in her studio for about 30 to 45 minutes. And we've loads of time at the end to answer any questions. You can add those in through the Q&A or the chat that is in the Zoom functions. But otherwise, I'm going to pass it over to Aoife. As I said, thanks everyone for joining us. My name's Shauna, by the way, and if you have any questions, um, just feel free to, to message me. Okay, over to you Aoife. Thanks everyone. Great, thanks Shauna. Hi everybody, thanks a million for joining us today. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Shauna and to the DCCI for hosting this seminar so that we can have a little chat about millinery tools and equipment. Um, for, I'd just like to give you a little introduction about myself first. So my name is Aoife Carwin and I'm a milliner. Um, how I got into millinery was a little bit um, or roundabout. Um, so I used to work in retail for a long time and then the recession came and I was made redundant. So I decided to retrain and I went to um, study fashion design in Dublin. And while I was there, I won a fashion um, design competition to design an accessory for Harvey Nichols. Um, and I won that competition and that led me to think that 
accessories might be a good route for me because um, it, you know, it's still pretty much a handcrafted industry and that's what I really wanted. I wanted to make things every day with my hands. Um, so I went to London College of Fashion to study millinery and that's where the world of millinery opened up to me and I just fell in love with the whole process because it was so hands-on and everything was so traditional and because I get to, to collect these amazing wooden shapes that we see, these hat blocks. Um, so what this little chat is about um, is about the tools and equipment that we use in proper millinery. Now I know some of you will already know some of these things and some of you are brand new to millinery so you won't know any of these things but I'm hoping that everybody will get something out of this little chat um, and as Shauna said if you have any questions at all just type them in and we'll get to them at the end um, um, and yeah, so yes let's get started. So I'd like to start with the poupe and um, so a poupe looks like this. And it's basically the milliner's equivalent of a tailor's dummy. Um, so it's a cam canvas or calico covered head. And um, it's most importantly, it's anatomically correct. So as you can see at the back, it's got this occipital bone, which is the bump at the back of your head. And it has the nose and the chin at the front. It has a center front to center back line and it's on a spinner. So this is very different from um, the polystyrene heads you might have seen uh, some people use. Um, if you've ever gotten your hands on one of those, you'll see that they're more like a ball with a face on it. And that's really useless to us in millinery um, because if you're designing on something that's not the size and shape of a head, your balance is going to be thrown off. Um, also, it doesn't look well because it throws the proportions out. So if you're using it to take photographs of your hats, the clients aren't going to get a good representation of what the hat is actually going to look like on a proper head. So you're much better off getting something like this. So for example, what I would use it for, um, I use it for every design we do. So say I was doing a bridal piece and I had my base blocked. So what I do is I'd come along and I would pin it to the poupe wherever it's sitting on the customer's head. And then I would start to design and add bits. So I would like say, maybe we want to add some veiling to this piece. So do we want the veiling to come down to the eye line or to the nose or to the chin? And once that's decided on, I can go away and block my veiling, come back, have it attached to my base, pin it back on the head. And now I can see if the balance is thrown off slightly, if we need to add something on the other side. So it's maybe some feathers or some flowers or something else. So you're constantly readapting your design and bringing it back to the poupe instead of you standing in front of a mirror and trying to hold your hat on the head and dropping a feather on the floor or sticking a pin in your finger and um, it's it's more complicated that way but also you're working with a mirror image not a true image so you're not actually seeing the hat as it is in real life also with the poupe you can stand back and look at it from all different angles and make sure that she's not taking up the entire aisle of the church and things like that. And um, so that's your poupe and it's used for every single design. Then the next one I'm going to show you is a dolly head. So I'm just going to get this out of the way. So a dolly head looks like this. And um, so it's quite similar, but it's made from wood. And this is one version. So you can see it's just got the eye line. There's no nose and chin, but it is the size and shape of a head. And it's got the occipital bone at the back. Also, this is another version. It looks like this. So this is more similar to the last poupe um, because it's got the nose and the chin, so the entire face. So when you're buying these, the one that just has an eye line is cheaper to buy because it's obviously easier for the hot block maker to make. So it's up to you. If you're good at visualizing things in your own head and you can tell from the eye line where the nose and the chin is going to be, then you can go with the cheaper option. If not, you might need to get something with the entire face. Now these, because they're made from wood, as well as all your design work, you can also use them to block. You obviously can't use your poupe to block because you would wreck it with the steam and moisture. Um, so if you had a brim block over here like this one, you could use this to block a crown and then attach that to it. You could also use this to make a turban. 
you could use this to make a clash, you could use it to make a fascinator, you could use it to make a bandu. So there's hundreds of different options all from one head. So that's your dolly heads, quite similar to the pupae. Now, a cheaper option again is called a utility or skull block, which looks like this. So it's not as pretty as the last ones. As you can see, there's pin marks, there's dents in it all over the place but that doesn't um, affect its usability whatsoever. So this is a really clever way of you, for you to build up your sizes because it's much, much cheaper to buy. Um, it's actually made from balsa wood, which is a really, really lightweight wood. So it's light as a feather, which means you can search for this on online websites like eBay and Etsy, getting it secondhand, cheaper again, but also the postage is gonna be cheaper because it's so lightweight. Now, because it's such a soft wood, you can just get your pins and literally do that with your hand and it just sticks right in, whereas you can't do that with the harder woods. Um, so it's not going to last you as long because it's a soft wood, so it's going to get more damaged easier. Um, but it is a workhorse and it's a cheaper option, so it's a good way to build up your sizes. So if you're going to be going into custom work, you're going to need to have all the different head sizes. Um, if anybody doesn't know how to take their head measurement, I'm going to do that now. So basically, you want to take a tape measure. You want to feel for the occipital bone in the back of your head, so the big bump at the back. And you're going to take your tape measure over that bump, so around the widest part of your head, basically, to your forehead, like so, over your ears, not on top of them. And that will give you your head measurement. So mine is a 21 and a half. Now, everybody's different. And a standard head size for women is 22, for men is 23. But that's like saying the average woman is a size 10. You're not gonna get it through your door that often. I get from a 19 inch all the way to a 24 and everything in between. Um, so if you're making for yourself, you're gonna want to make to buy all your hot box in your head size. But if you're going to be um, making for other people, you need to decide if you're going to be offering a standard size, which is a 22. If you're doing that, you might be alienating a lot of your customers that aren't a 22, or else you might offer um, three different sizes. So you might have a 22 as a medium and then offer a larger size and a smaller size. Um, but again, you might be alienating a lot of people. So if you're doing custom work, you're better off having all the different sizes. And um, so that's why this guy is such a good idea. So if you have one of the more expensive ones in the standard size 22 or in your head size, and then have all your, all your other sizes in these cheaper ones, then if somebody calls you up and says, can you make me a hat? You can automatically say yes, instead of saying, well, you'll have to come down, I'll have to measure your head and then I'll have to measure the block um, and see if I can make you a hat because already you've lost their concentration. They're thinking about who, who's the next milliner they can call. So it's just a clever way to build up your sizes um, and it's a nice, easy block to use. You can use it for all your design work and because it's wood, you can use it for all your blocking as well. So that is your uh, skull or utility block. I don't know if anybody's had any luck on any hat block websites. Um, there is one haplock maker I would recommend a lot for people who are starting out, and that is Guy Morse Brown. So it's Guy as in guys and dolls, Morse as in Morse code, and Brown as in the colour, Guy Morse Brown. And they are based in England, and they make incredible haplocks. He, I think he's a third generation haplock maker. Um, haplock making is an art form in itself. And it's really important that you get it from a reputable hot block maker instead of maybe somebody who might just be a carpenter and has never made a hat before and doesn't know exactly what we need as milliners. Um, so there is new people popping up the whole time um, and they might be master carpenters, but you're better off staying away um, unless they have studied actual hot block making and um, because you can end up with blocks that are balanced wrong that don't fit the head right, that are made from the wrong wood. Um, you know, I've seen disasters. So it might look like a cheaper block um, and you might think you're getting a great deal, but in the long run, it's not going to make good hats and you're not going to be able to resell it because nobody in the industry will buy it off you if you decide to try to pass it on to somebody else. 
Um, so Guy Morse Brown, they make great blocks. Um, they are very well priced, so they give you re really good value for money. Um, they also have a very user-friendly website, so you can go on and um, look at what other people have made using the blocks in a customer creations page, which is very helpful because a lot of people find it very hard to visualize the blocks as actual hats. Um, they also offer a block every month uh, with a special discount, so it's the block of the month. Um, and they picture most of the hat blocks on heads, which makes it easier to visualize. So just for example, I'll show you. I take one of these blocks here and um, so they'll have a pictured actually on a head so you can see what it will look like when you make it and um, so yeah by Morris Brown is a good one to start with and um, if you do go onto the website you'll see that they have their blocks divided into different categories and the two main categories is the crown block crown block section and the brim block section and those two will be subdivided into different categories again so the crown block is obviously the top half of the hat and the brim block is the edge bit of the hat so in the crown block section first of all we have solid crown blocks so I'm going to show you one of them so this is a solid crown block it's a dome crown um, and it's just a one piece block but also in that section you might have things like a pillbox something like this and um, so this wouldn't have a corresponding brim but it is a, a crown um, and it is solid so it could be in the solid crown block section so every hat block maker is different some block makers will love making pillboxes and if so they'll have a whole section for pillboxes if not they might just have one and they'll pop it into a solid crown block section so if you're searching for something like a side beret like this guy um, and you can't find it it might be under a solid crown block section and um, we have some more side berets here so this is another one a nice point to it and we have this one here again a nice point a nice curve so these are slide berets um, but they might be in a solid crown block section. Then we have another section in the crown block section will be puzzle blocks. And these are some of my favorites. So this one is a vintage, um, a vintage puzzle block from America from the 1940s. And as you can see, it's a very elaborate shape. So if you were to imagine we were to block our felt on this, and let it dry and add our stiffeners and let it dry and take out all our pins. It would be very hard to get the hat off the block without damaging that lovely shape that we worked so hard to get into it. So puzzle blocks are the answer. Um, so basically you take your fabric, I'm just demonstrating with a piece of towel. Um, so pop it over, you'd steam it and stretch it and work with it for about an hour to get it to, into that shape and pin it into place. You'd let it dry, you'd add your stiffeners and you'd let it dry again, take out all your pins and everything. And then you'd very carefully turn it upside down and take out your center piece, like so. And then you have four more pieces. You take out your two smaller ones. And then your two larger ones. And what you'll end up with is a perfectly shaped hat and a perfectly undamaged block with the key being very little effort. So you'll see um, if you come to do one of my courses um, how hard it is to get your hat off the block without damaging the shape. In the industry, we call it birthing a hat because you're trying to get a very large solid shape out of a very small hole without damaging either piece. So, Puzzle blocks are great for anything that's very hard to get out. Um, with the vintage ones like this one, you'll see there's usually newspaper. I don't know if you can see that. Newspaper on the inside. Um, so that is because steam and moisture would get into these joints and start to warp the wood. So every month or so milliners would take their blocks apart and they would sand down the pieces and then they would paste the newspaper on to make the joints nice and smooth again. So it's a really nice feature of the vintage ones. 
also you'll notice there's little um, circles on the blocks here um, and that's to help me put the puzzle pieces back in the correct position so I'm not damaging these lovely joins in the centre. Also there'll usually be a dash to don donate the centre front of your hat and then with the vintage ones there's usually a code uh, a code number, a company name and the hat size here. So this is designed for a 22 and a half inch head. Um, so when this block is made and when you put it on somebody's head, it just clamps on to the back of the head absolutely perfectly without the need for elastics and combs and wires and things like that. So it just goes to show the art of actually making blocks and why it's so important to go with a proper hat block maker. Um, so that's your puzzle blocks. They are for any shape that's very hard to make. You can buy all your modern shapes as puzzle blocks. Now they're gonna be more expensive because they are harder for the block maker to make. But just an example of a modern one here. Um, this one is a top hat puzzle block. So you can see brand new shape, um, but it does, come apart in different sections so that I can get it out like that. Okay. Um, so that's your puzzle box. Um, so if you um, then go on to brim blocks, um, I'll show you this guy. So this is a classic standard downturn block. Um, it's quite a large one, this one, it's my Audrey brim. Um, so the downturn blocks um, turn down, obviously, and then you see get upturn blocks and they turn up. So there are the two main sections in the brim block section. Um, so with the downturn blocks, they're very versatile because you can block them to any width you like. So if a customer comes to me and says, oh, I love your Audrey block, but maybe I'm quite petite and I'm worried it'll drown me out, we're like, no problem. So instead of blocking to the full width, we block to here or to there or to there. So we can block it as shallow or as wide as she wants. Also, it doesn't matter what head size she is because all we have to do is change what's called a collar. So I'm going to show you some collars now. So a collar is basically a piece of wood that's the size and shape of a head. Um, so if you're getting a downturn block and you're going to be doing custom orders, you're better off to get all your sizes. So for example, if she comes in, she's a 22 inch head, we just pop it on a 22 inch collar and now it's a 22 inch block. But if she comes in and she's 23 and a half, we pop on a larger collar. So that's just making the head size bigger or smaller. Um, so it means that you can block a lot of different sizes and widths with the one block making it really versatile. Now this block in particular is really versatile because it's what we refer to as a double brim block. So at the time I purchased this, um, instead of me buying two big brims separately, I brought them put together. So if she comes in and she's like, oh, I love your Audrey block, but maybe I have something very similar and I want something a bit different this year, we're like, no problem. And we just turn it upside down, take out our spinner, pop it underneath. And now I have a different shape. So it's more flat on this side. Um, so you can get any two um, downturn blocks put together as one, um, but they will obviously have to be the same width. Um, and it does save you a bit of money. Now, the problem with it is um, it does increase the weight of the actual block a lot. So if you have any neck, shoulder or back issues, this might not be a good idea for you if it's a big block because you need to do this for a lot of time while you're steaming um, and while you're manipulating and moving it around, it just adds a lot of weight to the block. So just keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind, if you're going with a downturn brim, you always want to get what's called a rope line. So a rope line looks like this on this block here. Um, so it's this edge here that goes all the way around the block. And the idea of this is when you're blocking, you put a rope in here to help you hold the piece on the block without using too many pins. Um, and why it's so important to have on a downturn block is when I block this side of my brim, 
I pin into here with a million pins. And when I block on this side, I pin into here with a million pins. And what that does, if you can see, I don't know if you can, it creates a million pinholes. And what that does is let steam and moisture into our blocks. And unfortunately that creates cracks in the block. So eventually this brim will break. Um, so I should have done was order it with a rope line in between the two blocks which would have gone here and then when I was blocking I could have used a rope instead of all those pins and that would have saved me crying when this breaks <laughs> and so learn from my mistakes if you're going with a downturn brim always get a rope line rope lines and things like that are added extras so they don't necessarily always come with the block so do keep that in mind but you can always ask your block maker about things like that. They're very helpful in Guy Morris Brown and they don't mind you asking questions. And um, so you can always contact them and ask them if, if they would suggest a rope line with this block or not. And um, so that's your downturn. This one here, I'm gonna pop it down. That was quite a big one. I'll also show you this one here is a little mushroom. It's a vintage block from the 50s. And um, so again, this is just the brim, it's not the crown. And um, so it's the outy bit of the hat. You would block a brim separately and then attach that those two together. So you can see this is a much smaller downturn brim. Um, the next ones I want to show you then are called upturn brims. So obviously they turn upwards. And um, I'll show you this one here. So again, upturn brims have their advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage is they look amazing. Um, now they are a bit more expensive uh, because they are harder for the block maker to make. Um, but they really do look amazing when they're made. So I'll just show you, that's the way it will look on the website. But if you wanted to see it on the head, you actually need to turn it upside down. So it actually sits like this. Now this bit is not part of the hat. So the line starts here and it goes up at the side down at the back, up at the side, and down at the front. So it's actually a little riding hat brim, um, and it's really nice. But um, the thing about them is, this is the where the head goes, that's the head size. So it's only ever going to make that size. Um, so just keep that in mind, they're not as versatile as the downturn brims. The other thing about it is, um, obviously when you're when your head when you're blocking it you want to you'll have to put it like a million pins in here so another added extra you can buy is called a pressing ring and i'll show you one of those now so a pressing ring is basically a ring that's an inch size smaller than your head size opening and when you push that in it just pushes the fabric down and makes that join nice and smooth so you can add it to the crown easily and um, so that one's a little cocktail upturn brim. So it goes up at the back, down at the front. It's quite cute. And um, so again, an added extra, you have to, to order any added extras at the same time because everything's handcrafted. So he can't make it for you a week later. And um, you do need to order it at the same time. That's a modern one. This one's a vintage one. And it also has a pressing ring. So again, you have to imagine it upside down. So you can see it goes up at the back and down at the front and the pressing ring just pushes in to make that join nice and smooth and easy to block. The great thing about upturn brims is you can do what's called blocking in one. So usually with the downturn brims, you would block your brim and your crown separately and then attach those together. But with this, you can block them both at the same time, which does cut down on labour, which is great because millinery is such a labour intensive process. Anything that cuts down on your time a little bit is great. And um, so if you are doing blocking in one, you need to make sure that your crown block is an inch size smaller than your brim block to leave room for your felt. So I'll just show you that if you just take this fabric, you would block it over your brim and then take your crown and push it in at the same time, meaning you have your crown and your brim blocked in one. So that's blocking in one. So that's the main advantage 
of the upturned brims apart from they look great. So that's your upturned brims. The other thing I want to show you is spinners. So I'm going to grab my utility block again. So if you look under any kind of hat block, you'll usually see these three holes. So the center hole is for your spinner. The two outer holes then are finger holes, and they are basically to help you hold the block up over the steam while you're working it, and also to give you leverage when you're taking your hat off the block. So the center hole is, as I said, for a spinner. So I'm going to show you a spinner. And that is on the bigger one that we here. So this metal piece underneath my block is called a spinner. And its only purpose in life is to keep my block up off my work surface so that I have room to manipulate my fabric when I'm blocking. Um, and it gets the same because it spins the block. Um, so it's pretty much standard in the industry. Whoever you get your blocks from, they usually fit your spinners. And um, if you're going to be getting into memory in a big way, you'll need a lot of spinners because you'll never be blocking one hat at once. You'll always be blocking five or 10 or more <laughs> at the same time. So you'll need a few spinners. Now, the uh, exception to the rule being, um, if you buy vintage blocks like I do, Sometimes the center hole can be a bit small, and in that case, it won't fit your modern spinners. You will need to buy a vintage spinner, which just has a smaller top on it that would fit into the smaller hole. Now, it's not hard. If you're handy, you can just get a dowel rod, a two by four and a screw. It's not that difficult to do, and they're quite cheap as well, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, so that's your spinners. Then I want to show you um, fascinator blocks. So fascinator blocks, also called cocktail hats, or they used to be called cocktail hats. Um, they're little one-piece wonders. Um, they don't usually have a corresponding brim. Um, but what you are looking for in fascinator blocks is this hollowed out base underneath. And that's really important because you don't want your hat to finish on the edge. You want it to continue on to the inside to create a nice finish. So that's a couple of fascinating blocks. This is another one. They come in all different shapes and sizes. You know, there's they're pretty much self-explanatory. There's not that much to them, um, but they're great fun. And um, lots of different shapes, sizes, things you can do. Now, um, as millinery is a fashion um, industry. Uh, things come into trend, into season, um, and at the moment it is the headbands, as everybody knows, and the crowns and the bandus. Um, so this is a bandu block. It's quite thin. You do need to be careful with the um, the thinner blocks, that because you can easily go straight through them with your pins, and then you can create cracks when the steam and the moisture get into them. So just be very careful and they're very easy to snap if you're applying too much pressure to them. And um, so that's a nice bandu block. So it would sit right over the head. And um, this is a crown block or a raised headband block. They're very popular right now with the races. And well, when they come back in, when we get back to the races and the weddings, they'll be popular again. Um, this is another crown block, so this one has a flat back to it. And again, sits on the head quite high. So there are fascinated blocks. There's hundreds of different types and styles. Um, a lot of people ask me what they should buy if they are just starting in millinery. What blocks should they buy? And unfortunately, that's not really a question I can answer for you because it depends on your customer profile. Um, if you contact Guy Morris Brown, for example, and say, oh, I'm new to millinery, what blocks do you suggest I buy? They'll usually say a cloche block. So I don't know if you know a cloche. Cloche comes uh, from the French word meaning bell. So it looks like a bell, comes down quite tight and then goes out. Um, they were very popular in the 20s and 30s. If you think of Downton Abbey era hats, that's a cloche. Um, so they are suggesting usually a cloche block because it's a very easy shape to make, which it is. But if you can't sell that, so if your customer isn't looking for the 1920s, 1930s look, very vintage, 
um, if they're not going to buy that from you. There's no point in you making them. So it depends on what your customer is looking for as to what you want to buy. And um, if you're making for yourself, obviously just buy blocks that you like. I would suggest that you buy blocks that you can do a lot with, so that are very versatile um, and that you can get lots of different seasons out of. So every season I have to make my blocks look new by um, swapping out the crown or um, doing the design differently, different fabrics, different colours. Um, but if it's a very distinctive block, it's quite hard to do that because people will rem remember it from last season. So um, just be careful. Um, have a look on the website, have a look on Guy Morris Brown website and um, he has loads, loads to choose from. So don't um, have a look at other milliners and say, oh, I like that hat, so I'll copy it and buy the exact same block. Go have a look on the website yourself and see what you like and what suits your des design aesthetic and what will suit your customer most, most importantly and what they're looking for. And if you don't know, go ask them. <laughs> Um, the next thing I want to show you is um, saucer blocks. So saucer blocks are very popular as well. I'm going to start with this one. This is quite a small one. Um, again, with saucer blocks, you have to imagine them upside down. So this is what it will look like on a website, but you have to imagine it like this. So it makes more sense now. So it comes up at the back, and then you can cut it down as low as you want at the front. Um, so it's a saucer. Now, the thing with saucers is they have um, a hole where your head goes. Can you see that? So my head is creating a bump on the inside. So to recreate that, they supply you with what's called a presser. And that basically pushes the fabric in for you to recreate that bump. So when you put it against the head, it will fit. Okay? So most saucer blocks will come with a presser. If you want a rope line, Sometimes they come with it, sometimes you have to ask for one. Um, so that is a small circular one. Now, saucers come in all different shapes and sizes. I'm going to show you a few different ones. This one is a little bit bigger. So again, it's got a presser that pushes in the fabric so it will sit nicely against the head. This one, as you can see, has a rope line in it, which just makes blocking easier. Now, it's not um, vital to have a rope line on these ones. You can just use pins if you want, but it does help. So anything that cuts down on your effort is always good. Um, so I'll just show you what it looks like on the head. So I'm going to put it this way. So as you can see, this one has a nice bit of height to it. And it's nice from the side, has a nice bit of depth. Um, but yeah, as I say, all different shapes and sizes. Um, this one then, so the other two were upside down. With this one, you can see the bump is already in it. So this one's an oval one. It's a bit bigger again than the last two. And it's got the rope line in it here. And that makes quite a nice shape that would sit on either side of the head. And then we've got another one in here. Moving on to slightly bigger. So this one's quite big and you can see it's got a nice curve to it. And again, this is where your head goes in here. So it's an upside down hat <laughs> and it's quite a large block. Again, very heavy. So not good with any shoulder or neck or back problems because you are going to be lifting it a lot. You don't need a gym membership if you're a mother. Um, so I'm going to pop back there. So saucer blocks are great. They're very popular for race scores, for um, mothers of drive, mothers of groom. You can do a lot with them and they're quite simple and easy and there's not that much to them really. Um, then I do want to show you brim legs. I missed that when we were doing the upturned brim blocks. So when I was telling you about blocking in one, so blocking your crown and your brim at the same time, you will need something to lift it up. So with the other brims, the other blocks I was showing you, they had the spinner that goes in, in the center to hold it up off your work surface. Obviously you can't do that with an upturn brim block because that's where your head goes, in where the spinner would go. So you can get brim legs, again, an added extra. They go each side of the block and do the same purpose of holding the block up off the work surface and um, to give you room to block in one. So you can push in your crown block 
and it's not going to be hitting off your work surface like that. So another thing I wanted to show you was a veiling block. So um, I use a lot of veiling in my work. Um, and the thing about modern veiling is it's called usually called Russian veiling, um, but it usually comes from China and it's synthetic and it's plastic. Um, and it's very rough and it's going against a very delicate part of the face. Um, and if you put something plastic against the eyes or the soft skin under their eyes, it can cut you basically. <laughs> so um, you're much better off using silk veiling which is all I ever use in my work. And the great thing about silk veiling is it's a natural fiber, which means you can block it so you can shape it, which is really important because you want your veiling to sit away from the face instead of clamping onto your eyes and catching in your eyelids. Um, so to do that, you need a veiling block. So this looks quite like our skull utility block, but as you can see, it's much bigger and it has that lovely curve on the front that would go over the face um, and then this is where the hat would be. So that is how you make your veiling sit away from the face. You have to block it but it has to be a natural fibre. It can't be synthetic because you can't block synthetic fibres. So just to show you what that would look like, I can show you an example here of one of the newest hats. So it's a little breton but as you can see, the veiling is not sitting against the face. It's sitting away from the face. And that's because I've blocked it and because it's a vintage silk veiling. And it sits out perfectly away from the face. And it's a nice detail as well. So um, the next one I want to show you is ring blocks. So ring blocks are a really nice one to know about because they're so versatile, you can do so much with them. And also you can usually pick them up really cheap secondhand because a lot of people don't know what they are. And um, so a lot of people might find one of these when they're clearing out a house um, or a garage and they'll look at that and go, what is that? Um, so search for it under terms that you would describe this as if you found it on the street and you didn't know what it was. So um, search for like wooden ring, wooden donut, wooden terrine, wooden circle. Um, and if you find them, grab them because they're gorgeous. Um, they were very popular in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and then they just kind of fell out of people's minds because people weren't being taught what they were. Um, but they're so versatile, you can do so much with them. So for example, this is a vintage one um, from the 50s. Um, and say I wanted to do a little cocktail trilby. So I get my little um, crown block. So this is like a little miniature block. Again, Guy Morse Brown. Um, and I pop it onto a little cocktail brim like this. And then say I blocked it, my felt over it. And then I had a look at the design and I went, well, that's not really what I had in my mind. I wanted something that came up at the back more and down at the front like a classic trilby, um, but maybe I didn't have the extra money to buy the little cocktail brim that we had here a minute ago. Um, so this would be perfect for that little cocktail brim and it would fit the, the crown block really well. But maybe you don't have the extra money to buy a brand new block just for one design. So what you do, you grab your handy ring block, pop it over your crown, then block into the back all the way around with your pins and your steam and then block down at the front all the way around and then obviously let it dry, stiffen it, cut it, wire it and now you have a trilby. But say you didn't want a trilby, you wanted a cowboy hat. So you block up the two sides, block down the front and down the back and now you've got a cowboy. Block up one side and down the other you've got a padre. Block it up the whole way around you've got a breton. So this little block can make hundreds of different hats. Um, so they can be big or small. As you see, this is a really modern crown and it fits this vintage block perfectly. Um, it's a circular one, this one, but I've also got oval ones. 
um, you need to leave room for your felt, remember? So always make sure your crown is an inch size smaller than your brim if you're doing it in one. Um, so yeah, it can be circular, it can be oval. This can be as small as to go around a cocktail crown or it can be as big as to go over your skull, skull or utility block. So for example, if you bought a cheap skull block, I'll show you the skull block again. If you bought a cheap one of these, second hand maybe, and if you bought a cheap second hand one of these that fitted over it, you can now make hundreds of different types of hats, all from two very cheap blocks. Instead of you buying a top hat crown and a top hat brim, and only ever being able to make a top hat. So some people ask me, oh my God, millinery is so expensive. You know, what, you know, what should I invest in? Um, it doesn't have to be expensive. If you buy blocks that do a lot for you and work really hard for you, um, it's about being clever about your blocks and buying blocks that really work hard for you. Um, and the ring blocks are great for that. Now Guy Morris Brown is making these new if you wanted to buy a new. I just love, um, searching for old things online and in markets and auctions and things like that. Um, but yeah, so that's your ring block, like that. Um, I also want to show you this. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these before. So this is a ribbon board or a ribbon plate. Um, so sometimes when you make a brim, you want to add um, something over your wire. Um, so you might want to add a ribbon or a fabric, but you need to shape that before you put it on to, before you start to stitch it onto your hat. Um, and that's where the ribbon board comes in. So you dampen your ribbon or whatever fabric you're using, cut on the bias. Um, and then you pin it onto your ribbon board with two pins and you stretch it really taut the whole way around until you've reached the end of your ribbon and then pin it into place. And then you let it dry. And once you take it off, then it's the perfect shape to put it around the edge of your brim without any gathers or folds. It will just sit perfectly. And um, so it's a handy piece of kit to have. Uh, not essential, you can use an iron if you want, but they really are handy. And um, I just wanted to show you some other shapes in blocks, just because a lot of people, um, some people like really big wide brims um, and this is an example of that so this week sorry um, for just a flag yeah. that we're coming up on 50 minutes oh um, no problem sorry no you're okay, okay. Um, I, we, I, get, I get into talking and I never stop <laughs> <laughs> we just might leave some time for questions if that's okay yeah perfect no problem Brilliant. Um, well, first of all, we're getting lots of lovely feedback. Thank you very much to everyone uh, for your comments. And Aoife, you did a brilliant job. We're getting um, a lot of lovely comments from people saying that you're a fantastic teacher and you have a great pace. Um, a couple of these questions you might have already answered, but um, I'll, just, I'll just go through them all. No uh, Leon wants to know, where do you get the canvas covered head? And Maureen wants to know where you can buy the poupe. I assume they're both. Yeah, they're both the same. <laughs> yeah. um, so if you Google it, um, you'll get lots of different options. You can get them secondhand. Just make sure, sometimes if you're looking on eBay and Etsy, they're not actually poupes, they're wig heads. And you'll be able to tell the difference because it won't have a face, it won't have the nose and the chin, and it usually doesn't have the occipital bone. So it's more like just a rounded shape. Um, I got that one from Spain, I think. Um, let me see the back of it. Um, yeah, Antigua Casa, I think it was. Um, but just Google them. I mean, Stockman do them. Any mannequin makers will make these, but just make sure that it looks anatomically correct. Fantastic. Um, I'm not sure if John is, is having a good joke, but he's wondering what is the biggest head you've ever had to make a hat for? I actually measured a 25 inch head. <laughs> May have been for you, John, is it? Tell us the truth. <laughs> Very good. And Elaine was wondering, have you ever used the foam type blocks? The which? Oh, foam blocks, no. Um, <laughs> I don't like foam blocks. Um, they're not gonna last you. Um, 
It's okay if you want to make a unique shape for a custom order and um, you can make your own blocks out of foam um, you might be referring to that. That's fine. Like I sometimes I'll make a block out of clay or something if it's something custom that I don't have enough time to order from a block maker because they do make everything to order. So it takes three to six weeks depending on what you're looking for. Um, but no, I would advise not. It's not going to last you. And also you're, for the amount of time you put into it, you're going to have to pass that cost on to your customer. There's not a lot of customers that are willing to pay for a custom block as well as their hat. Um, and also you're not going to be able to resell it because milliners like to get these. The great thing about locks, even though they are expensive, is they do hold their value really well. So if you buy a block and it just doesn't sell for you or you don't like it, you can always resell it as long as you look after it for about 90% of its value. Brilliant. Thanks, Aoife. Um, really lovely comment here. It's great to see we have some young uh, members in the webinar. So we have seven-year-old Clara. who Hello. Hey, Clara. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, she was just wondering, her and her mum, Ethel, were wondering if it's possible to make any blocks at home in the kitchen or is there any shapes in the house that might work for making her own hats? <laughs> Not really. Um, you do kind of need to invest in the proper equipment. Um, now I've seen people use salad bowls. If it's a wooden salad bowl, that might work. Um, but that's about it. So maybe Clara, that's a good investment if one day you want to become a milliner like Aoife. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, Aoife, another question from Lauren. Do the saucers come in a general size with the presser or do they come in different head sizes? Yeah, that's a good question. So most of these block are, blocks are head size blocks, but um, for things like cocktail blocks, and um, so anything that's actually smaller than the head or larger than the head, it's usually a one size fits all option, which is great um, if you're going to be making for other people. And um, so saucers usually don't come as a head size, they just come as one size fits all. Fantastic. Um, someone was wondering about what steaming methods Yes, I wanted to show you that next and then I ran out of time. Um, <laughs> so this is a steamer. Okay, uh, it's called, the brand name is Jiffy. They make all different types of steamers, but what you're looking for is a Jiffy hat steamer. It's really important. It's an actual hat steamer, not a wallpaper steamer or a clothes steamer. Um, it's really sturdy. Um, it's got a huge reservoir of water so it doesn't run out as you're blocking because you'll be using it for long periods of time. It's got a bronze nozzle. It's got a high pressurized jet of steam, which means it's not going to be spitting and marking your felts. But also it's, it doesn't run up your electricity bill and you can't knock it over too easy, um, which is handy for any like me. Um, so yeah, Jiffy Hat Steamer is what you're looking for. You can get them new from, and it's like saying people ask me, why did you buy that? Um, it's like saying, where do you buy Dyson? All different electronical places will have it. So just Google Jiffy Hat Steamer and you'll get loads of options. Brilliant, and for stiffening as well as, for stiffening. Yeah, so there are more materials. Um, so you, it depends what you're stiffening. If you're stiffening a felt hat, you'll want felt stiffener. If you're stiffening a straw hat, you'll want straw stiffener. If you're stiffening um, cinema, it's water-based millinery stiffener. Um, the, the straw and the felt stiffener are both chemical-based stiffeners. Um, yeah, so that's what you use. Very good. We had one comment from Noreen from Canada who said she was actually due to pick up a hat from you for, from Punchestown. Yes. Hi! <laughs> Sarah, thanks all the way from Canada. Thanks very much, Nori. Um, for covering the blocks, do you suggest cling film or what materials would you use? Yes, so it's really important that before you block, you cover all your blocks. With, I use cling film. Some milliners like to use tinfoil, other milliners like to use glad wrap, which is um, it's a wrap that's more popular in Australia and America, I think, than here. It's hard to get your hands on. I like cling film and um, you cover your blocks because they're made from wood and they don't work well with steam and moisture. Steam and moisture are their worst enemies so it can create cracks in the block but also you're trying to stop your hat from sticking to the block and um, so I always put cover it with cling film make sure you've covered it all and I always take your cling film off after you take your hat off because any moisture can, that can be trapped in between the layer of the cling film and the block you want to make sure you've gotten rid of that. 
Great, thank you, Aoife. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for now. If anyone has any more, please just keep continuing to putting them into the chat. Uh, Aoife, was there anything else you wanted to go through? Yeah, just while I have a minute. Yeah, go um, for it. I wanted to show you um, a runner downer, or a puller downer, sorry. So a puller downer looks like this, and it is used for when you are blocking crowns. Sorry. So um, crowns like this. And um, if you have a felt, you'll want to use the puller downer while you're blocking to get your edges nice and um, straight so you're not um, pulling the felt out of line too much if you want to be doing a brim and a crown separately. So that's a puller downer. Or a, yeah, puller downer. Um, and also I wanted to show you a runner downer. So a runner downer looks like this. So it's got a little edge on it here. And what that is used for is again blocking crowns. So you would get your blocking cord and put it over your crown and then pull it really tight. And you would use the runner downer to run it down all the way along the crown. So that's a runner downer. And um, another thing is a pin pusher. Pin pushers are really important. Um, and that is for when you're blocking, it helps you push the pins in. So it's got um, a little magnet up the top and then the shaft which helps push it in for you and um, it's just a lot easier than using a thimble. Um, do we still have time or do we have more questions? We have another question from Patricia. She's just wondering if you glue the ribbons or stitch them and if you do glue them what would you recommend? No glue in millinery. <laughs> <laughs> And um, people always say, what, what glue guns do you use? We don't use glue guns in proper tradition, will we? Um, I was always taught that anything on a hat should look organic. So if there's a flower on a hat, it should look like it grew there. If there's a feather on a hat, it should look like a bird dropped it on the hat. And um, you should be able to look at a hat and go, how did they do that? Instead of saying, well, there's the glue. And um, so everything I do is hand stitched. And um, you use a, a stitching technique called invisible stitches. Um, to do the ribbon on the edge of a hat. And I can show you that in any of my courses. <laughs> Fantastic. The only time we use um, a sewing machine, I know somebody asked about a sewing machine, um, the only time I use a sewing machine in millinery is to do my linings and also for window paint cinema. For everything else, it's hand stitching. Great, Aoife. And Noreen just wanted to know what type of blocking pins would you recommend? Yeah, that's a very good question. Also here. Um, so uh, it's really important that your blocking pins are super, super, super strong, okay? Now that does not mean that they're really thick and um, thickness does not equal strength. And um, so you don't want to be using drawing pins. I've seen people use drawing pins. I've seen people use thumbtacks. That's lethal for your block. So what you want is, I just don't know if you can see these, these are tiny. Um, okay, so it's a steel, straight steel dressmaking pin but it's really, really strong. So how you test it, you just take a pin out of your box and you try to bend it. Now, if you bend it, if you can bend it, it's useless because once you try to put it into the block, it'll snap because you're going through your felt, through your cane and into the block. So if it's not super, super strong, it's not gonna work. So I get these in England um, from McCulloch Wallace um, to just be, just be careful where you get them from. But that's what you're doing for the pin pusher. They also can't have um, a glass head or a plastic head on them because then they won't fit into the pin pusher. Um, it's really important. Now, if you're doing cinema, you'll want to use the red blocking pins. You'll see them on any of the millinery supply websites. Um, and then, as I say, for anything with a rope line, you would be using your blocking cord, which I showed you a minute ago. It's a nylon cord um, because nylon's harder to break than rope because you're putting a lot of pressure on it. And um, also there's blocking springs. So spring blocking springs are is a spring with a rubber tube on top and they come in head sizes. So whatever block you're using, use the same head size spring and that you basically roll that down all the way around to get a nice smooth finish and then it will hold it nice and tight in place for you once you reach the end. Okay. Great, Aoife. I'm just asking everyone if they have any other questions for you. Yeah, so while you're doing that, I'll show you a few more. Um, so uh, flower irons, they are 
really popular. Um, so these are used to shape petals. Um, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Again, Guy Morris Brown will make you a nice set of these. Um, and you need to heat these up. So you need a heat source. I use a little hot plate. It's very important that you don't use um, glass um, glass hob tops because you will wreck them with the irons. And um, so you heat them up um, until they're really, really hot. And then you take your silk that you cut out into a petal shape and you wet it and it needs to be stiffened silk. Um, and then you press the iron into the fabric and into the sandbag to create shapes. And every petal has to be shaped before it's all wired together to create roses. So I can show you those. So these are all silk roses. So they're all done individually and then stitched together into roses. Any other questions? Yes, Patricia, just wondering when your classes are on and how much they would be for the courses. Yes. So if you go to my website, aoife.carolmillinery.com forward slash courses, there's a whole page about courses. So the most popular one for people who haven't been with me before is the four day course. And that covers the three main millinery materials, which is felt, straw and cinema and how to work them from raw materials to three professionally finished pieces. So you're learning the entire process of three different fabrics and what they're like and their, their similarities and their differences. Um, and you end up with three hats by the end of the course. Um, I run my courses on a one-to-one -one basis because everybody works at their own pace. Um, and if it's a one-to-one, -one, then we can go as quick or as slow as you need to go. And I'll be walking you step by step through the process so you can be a total beginner. It doesn't matter. But if you're more advanced, um, we can go faster and go at your pace. Um, yes, yeah, so all the prices and everything are there. Um, I am offering, if anybody wants to book a course today, obviously I can't give you dates, but if you wanted to book it today with a deposit, I'm offering 10% off today if you mention the webinar. Thanks, Aoife. Um, a couple of more questions. So Noreen was wondering, if you don't want to invest in a Jiffy hat steamer, what steam iron would you recommend? Yes, so a lot of people ask me this and anybody who's done my course will testify. You can't do without a proper steamer, I'm afraid. Um, like I've seen people use broken kettles, I've seen people use saucepans, I've seen people stick a felt in the microwave, which is really bad for your felt. Um, I wouldn't suggest a steam iron. It's going to mark your felt. It's not going to give you a proper amount of steam. And without the proper amount of steam, it's really hard to block felt properly. Um, and straws and cinemas, they all need steam. Um, so I wouldn't suggest a steam iron for that at all. No problem. Um, Lauren is wondering the best feather supplier um, and the best way to work with them. The best way to work with feathers? Yes. Um, so it's a bit more complicated than I can describe in two sentences. Um, you're better off coming and doing a course, I'm sorry. Um, but they are, feathers are made from the same thing that your hair and your nails are made from. So they do need steam before you work with them. You can't work with them when, they'll, when they're dry or they'll split and crack. Um, so you do want to soften them like if you if you bend back your nail now it will snap but if you bend it back after you have a bath you know the way it will snap back. It's the same kind of idea so it doesn't need steam and moisture and then it reacts really well to heat like your hair does. No problem. Uh, John is, uh, I think he, you've got a new um, milliner <laughs> on board. He's saying he's, he's more than willing to come on board. So there you go. Um, but lots of thank yous from everyone. Um, a lot of people are saying how informative it is and how generous you've been with your time and your information, Aoife. And they're all saying it was really helpful. As I said, John's going to go and have a go, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, some really lovely comments. I, I think that's everything at the moment. If you want, I can um, share my screen and I, I can bring up your, your website really quickly. Here we go. So I suppose just for anyone who uh, wants to find out more information, it's aoifakiramilinary.com. And if you go to the courses page, 
to the courses page. We'll click on it here. Hopefully everyone can see this. There we are. I'll scroll down. There you go. And sorry, Aoife, did you say if there was something they had to quote or just... To which? Is there anything they need to quote for that 10% discount or? Yeah, just, just mention, so just give me a call. Um, obviously we can't discuss dates because we don't know when we're going to be back in action. Um, but you can book your course with a deposit today and I'll be offering 10% off um, courses booked today only. Um, just mention the webinar and you'll get your 10% off. Fantastic. Okay, I'm just going to check and see. I think that's it for... Um, for questions for now. Um, just like to say a huge thank you Aoife for taking the time and as everyone's saying being so generous with your information and your skills and knowledge. No problem. Um, as I said we will we are recording this and um, I'll stop the share now one second. We are recording this and we are hoping for it to be up on our YouTube channel very shortly which is for Design and Crafts Council Ireland. If you'd like to find out any more information on Get Ireland Making, please go on to dcci.ie forward slash learners forward slash Get Ireland Making. Um, some lots of lovely final comments, Aoife, to finish you off just saying how wonderful a teacher you are, very informative, and thank you very much for your honest sharing. No problem. So Thanks very well for joining. It was really good. Great way to finish. Uh, thanks for the 60 people who joined today. Um, and again, a special thank you to Aoife. And uh, we hope to see you at a webinar soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a million. Bye. Bye-bye.